Yeah, we are ready to go. A very good, a very good evening to all present here. I'm Arushi. Welcome to the fourth session of the Distinguished Speaker Series. I'm Arushi Poyarekar from the Student Speaker Nexus or TSSN. TSSN is a platform of students, by students, and for students, created by our team members who are from the age group 16 to 19 years. Our main goal is to connect inspiring speakers with aspiring students by organizing webinars conducted by experienced speakers from various disciplines and all walks of life. We try to help our students to get, to get clarity on various career options and a wide spectrum of opportunities in future. Since the COVID-19 lockdown, we have conducted around 30 sessions in which over 2,500 students have participated. The first session of the Distinguished Speaker Series was conducted by Professor Ellis Shashidhara sir on the 5th of September, where sir talked about how to build exciting careers in science for the post-COVID-19 world. This was followed by the second session of the Distinguished Speaker Series on the 10th of October by Dr. Arvind Chinsure sir, where sir shared his journey and spoke about doc and spoke about his journey in science, dreams, reality, and beyond. As a third distinguished speaker, we had Dr. Anand Deshpande speaking about getting ready for 2013-2020 on 20th of December. On behalf of the TSSN team, I would like to sincerely welcome and thank Professor Ajit Kembavi, sir, for gracing our platform as the fourth speaker in the TSSN Distinguished Speaker Series. We would also like to welcome our co-organizers from Jyotir Vidya Parisamstha and all participants from India and other parts of the globe. I would like to introduce a speaker for today, Professor Ajit Kembavi, a founder member and professor emeritus at the Inter University Center for Astronomy and Astrophysics, popularly known as IU Kapune. He serves as the vice president of the International Astronomical Union and is also a member of the Space Commission of India. Professor Kembavi earned his PhD from the Tata Institute of Fundamental Research, TIFR, with cosmologist Professor Jayant Narlikar. Professor Kembavi's area of expertise mostly includes gravitational theory extragalactic astronomy and astronomical database management. He has co-authored a number of books on the subjects of gravitation and cosmology. As an eminent astrophysicist, he is also a science communicator and mentor to young minds. Over to Professor Kaimbhavi. So can I begin now? Yes, sir. All right. So good afternoon, everyone. I'm very happy to be giving this talk to you. I would have greatly preferred to talk to you in person, but that cannot be because of the circumstances. The great advantage in speaking online like this is that people from far away can also participate uh, in the session and in the talk and in the discussion. <clears throat> the disadvantage is that the speaker simply can't see anyone. So is it like a singer uh, who has to sing without seeing who they are singing to? It's a very difficult job, but we'll manage. So I'm going to talk to you about the LIGO India project. Uh, so, but for that you need quite a lot of uh, <clears throat> quite a lot of preparation, which I'll go through in the relatively short time which is available to me. Right. So, <clears throat> so what is LIGO? Now LIGO stands for Laser Interferometric Gravitational Wave Detector, and this detects gravitational waves. So this uh, raises a lot of questions. Now, uh, what is the meaning of waves? What is the meaning of gravitational waves? Uh, how does one detect gravitational waves? And uh, what is the in interferometric gravitational wave detector? And what are lasers doing there? So there are lots and lots of questions. And then uh, we'll try to move through them uh, as quickly as possible. So uh, what are waves? I'm sure... Uh, <clears throat> I'm sure... Um, you, uh, before I go to waves, uh, let me just talk about uh, what is gravitational waves. So gravitational waves, these are, gra these are waves in the gravitational field that don't tell you very much because in the gravitational field known to you, which is a Newton's gravitational field, there are no waves, but I'll come to that soon. Now gravitational waves were first predicted by Einstein in 1916. It was quite a long time ago. He derived the general theory of relativity in 1950, and then in 1916, he first predicted gravitational waves. And then they were first detected exactly 100 years later in 2016. So it's a very long story, actually. 
So now what is wave motion? I'm sure all of you are familiar with waves from your uh, studies. So here you have got uh, something. It is a medium which is moving up and down, up and down, up and down. And if you look at a particular crest, it seems to be moving forward. So to see practical waves, these are waves in water. So if I throw a stone at one point, okay, then you clearly see circular waves emanating from that. And then it's intuitively clear to you what it is. Now here's another kind of wave where you've got a spring and then you move the spring in one, so on one side. And then you see that there's a wave of compression and rarefication, compression and rarefication, which again moves forward. This kind of a wave is called a longitudinal wave because the movement is in the same direction that the wave propagates. Whereas this kind of a wave motion is called transverse. Okay, meaning that the water goes up and down in one place, but it propagates in a direction, it propagates in a direction which is normal to the direction in which it moves. So this is known as a transverse wave. And how does one, how is the wave defined? I'm sure you, have, you know this, because if I sit at any point, there the water will be moving up and down, up and down. But if I, if I look at it in time, it is as if the water is up here, gradually moves forward. So the, so the, this is called a maximum. This is called a minimum. And the, <clears throat> the, the rest position will be somewhere here, which is the surface of water. And then this is the amplitude. And the distance between two crests or two troughs is known as the wavelength. Now, the most important waves for us in everyday life are, of course, electromagnetic waves. And you're all familiar with electromagnetic waves. So typically, there will be a tower. And this could be a tower which is broadcasting, say, some FM music that you listen to. And then the electromagnetic wave travel outwards. And then uh, they travel through space. And then they reach your device. And they activate your device. And you can listen to the music. It's fairly complex loading the music onto the electromagnetic wave and extracting it at the point of the divide, at the point of detection. But what we are interested in today uh, is actually the waves which carry the signal outwards. Now, electromagnetic waves, of course, are incredibly important for us today. And all these devices that you see, you've got a laptop here. And then most importantly, most, most importantly for young people, you've got a cell phone. And how do you get a signal for the cell phone? From you see the towers all over the place. They're very ugly, but they're very useful. And um, <clears throat> so if somebody's making a call to you, that call goes up to a satellite. From there, it beams to the ground station. It comes to a place like this. And from there, um, it is uh, the wave which is sent out from there. It activates your cell phone. So um, what is the spectrum of electromagnetic waves? Meaning, what is the wavelength? And what are the characteristics? So the kind of waves that we have been talking about uh, to listen to the radio or to uh, have cell phones, okay, those are those are those are short, those are long wavelength waves or low frequency because the higher the wavelength, the lower is the frequency. Right. So uh, then, as you go, these are the radio waves. As the waves become shorter, they the frequency increases. Then you get the microwaves, and then you get infrared radiation, and then you get visible light. So visible light, as you know, has got a wavelength between, say, 10,000 angstrom and about 4,000 angstrom, 3,000 angstrom. Then you get the ultraviolet part of the spectrum. Then you go to X-rays, which are very, very energetic, and then you get gamma rays, and then you can get TV waves. Right? So there's a whole spectrum which spans an extremely large range of wavelength. So now, uh, how does one understand waves? Because these waves, as you may know, had two kinds of fields in them, the electric field and magnetic field. And it was in the 1860s that the very great physicist, James Clerk Maxwell, uh, formalized all the knowledge which was there and gave his equations, which are known as the Maxwell equations, and these are four equations. And an immediate consequence of this equation is the equation which you see in the red box here, and that is known as the wave equation. So what did Maxwell do? 
he took all the external knowledge available to them, all the laws like Faraday's law <coughs> and Gauss's theorem, and put them together into these four beautiful equations. And then he predicted from these equations that electromagnetic waves exist. And these were detected some years later by Henrik Hertz. But by then, unfortunately, Maxwell was dead. So he did not see his, his uh, prediction uh, proven to be correct. And we already seen how important electromagnetic waves are for us. The other important interaction that you are aware of, first we talked of the electromagnetic field, but the other important interaction that you are aware of is known as the gravitation. gravitation. Everybody knows what is gravitation. Give me any two bodies with mass M1 and M2, and they are at a distance r apart, then the force between them is equal to minus g m1 m2 by r square. Everybody knows it. And it is the Newtonian gravity, it is the gravitational field which drives our universe. Because the Earth goes around the sun, and then the moon goes around the Earth because of gravity. Now, unfortunately, I don't have enough time to talk about this, but it, it is electromagnetic waves don't exist in Newtonian gravity. Newton's gravity is what is known as an action at a distance theory. Please excuse me for a moment. There's a source of noise. Sorry. <clears throat> So you see that um, it is uh, it is very well known that there are no gravitational waves within Newton's theory of gravity. So then, why do we talk about gravitational waves at all? And that is because Newton's theory of gravity has been superseded by the new theory given by Albert Einstein. Now, when we talk about new theory, it is uh, it's just a relative term because Newton's theory is more than 300 years old. Whereas um, a couple of decades ago, the 300th anniversary of that was uh, celebrated. And whereas Einstein's theory also is more than 100 years old, but it is a part of what is known as a modern development of physics. So when Einstein was a patent clerk in Bern, in Bern in Switzerland, in 1905, he gave what is known as a special theory of relativity. And in the special theory of relativity, he introduced the concept of space-time. So we have three dimensions of space and one dimension of time. And Einstein <coughs> brought these together <coughs> and got a single concept of space-time. It is four-dimensional. And one of the consequences, which you very well may know, is that in Einstein's theory, the speed of light is constant, regardless of how the source or the emitter move relative to each other. Then, uh, in 1915, Einstein combined, Einstein gave a theory of gravitation which was compatible with his special theory of relativity. <coughs> As it happens, Newton's theory was not compatible with special relativity. So Einstein struggled for 10 years to derive the theory, and he form, finally did it in 1915, <coughs> And it is known as the general theory of relativity. Now, in, in special relativity, Einstein unified space and time. In general relativity, he did something which was even more astonishing. He unified space time and gravity. So, wh what do you mean by that? So, Einstein said that, look, we take it for granted. We, we take it for granted in Newton's theory that space and time are immutable. Meaning that you, you don't say that, look, the nature of space changes, the nature of time changes for any reason whatsoever. But he said that space time is not absolute. The properties of space time can be affected by the presence of matter and energy. So if there is a, if there is much greater matter, I mean, for example, Supposing an object like the sun, which is very massive, you know that the mass of the sun is 2 into 10 to the 33 grams. It's a very great deal of mass. 
and so if you if you are in the vicinity of a very massive object like that then the properties of space time change because of the because of the effect of the matter and space time becomes curved and it is this curvature of space time which manifests itself as gravity this is really a remarkable theory because it takes something which was thought to be immutable makes it dynamic what do you mean by dynamic means that affected by matter of energy and it is the dynamical effect of space time which appears to us to be gravity does this mean that newton is wrong it doesn't mean it means no such thing it only says that in the approximation where we consider for example the movement of earth around the sun and then newton's theory gives almost exactly the correct make the exactly the correct predictions it is only when gravitational fields become strong and when the velocity is become very high that uh, that you have to go to a different theory right so einstein gave me the equations which look very beautiful like this they are incredibly complex equations and then these are what are known as tensor equations uh, and uh, they are very difficult to solve so then when you have a new theory you must have new predictions so einstein made several predictions one prediction he made was that if you shine a torch upwards from a gravitational field then as the light moves upwards it becomes redder in color this is known as the gravitational redshift whereas if it falls into the gravitational field then it becomes bluer in color then he made another astonishing another prediction about which there had been speculation even before the general relativity theory and before einstein's time that a gravitational field can bend a ray of light so here you see a notebook uh, uh, which is actually einstein's handwriting and he he was writing a letter to a friend uh, and it says zurich and 14th october 2013 before the theory was derived and here you see clearly it shows a light ray moving and bending so bending of light i mean he he made a calculation which was wrong but after he derived his theory he got the correct value of how much this bending is and other and it is from this bending that you get effects called gravitational lenses a third prediction which einstein made is that the um, the orbit of a planet which is a ellipse as you know that keeps swinging in space but what we are concerned today is the most beautiful prediction of his theory that <coughs> gravitational waves exist so i showed you i told you some time ago that you can take the four equations of maxwell and from there you can very straightforwardly show that electromagnetic waves must exist similarly but this is far more difficult in einstein's theory because you have to deal with tensor equations so when you look at those equations uh, then you can show einstein showed that when the gravitational field is weak they satisfy the equation which is exactly a wave equation and and then he also predicted that these waves move with exactly the same as the speed of light so what do you mean by this so you see that i got you can imagine that space time is flat but i introduce a very massive object like a star there and then you see that the space time has become curved right so now if you have got some perturbation occurring for example uh, <coughs> Uh, a thing like a pulsar, uh, then uh, as, as object is rotating, then you can have the emission of gravitational waves. The best source of gravitational waves, of course, is not a pulsar which is rotating round itself, but a pulsar uh, which is going round another object in an elliptical orbit. Because when you have this, and there is no symmetry, and there is copious emission of gravitational waves. so this this kind of an emission was first discovered by hulls and taylor in 1974 so what did they do <coughs> their idea was the, the the idea is very simple they first observed a pulsar whose period was changing and then it both its rotational period was changing meaning the uh, and pulsars have a very fixed rotation period but it changes very very slowly that is not important here but what is important is that the orbital period meaning uh, the the fact that it, the pulsar goes round in an it goes in an ellipse around the star gets its observed period to change 
And from there, you can conclude that the pulsar is going around the star in an elliptical orbit. So the point is that when you have such a binary system, it must be emitting gravitational waves. So you can see, this is not real gravitational wave. Of course, this is just a pure simulation. So <clears throat> a pulsar going around an orbit, the binary emits gravitational waves. And when these waves are emitted, energy is lost. And when energy is lost, the consequence is that the orbit must shrink. Because as the Earth is going around the Sun, it is in a fixed orbit. But supposing the two objects are very massive and very close to each other, then the Earth-Sun system also would be emitting gravitational waves. And if they emitted gravitational waves, the system would lose energy. And the consequence would be it would move close to <clears throat> it will move closer and closer together. So you see that here, you can see the orbits, and as time passes, the orbit is shrinking. And uh, how do you <clears throat> how do you uh, measure that whether that is lost? So you see that the period of the pulsar going around the uh, other companion neutron star is measured, and then it is observed. You can see here <clears throat> these dots. They represent the, the, the reduction in the period. It is a, it's a complicated thing. It's not straightforward reduction in period, but they represent the reduction in the period. So these measured dots. And then this line that you see here, which very beautifully passes through the observed points, is the line which is predicted from Einstein's general theory of relativity applied to gravitational waves. So Einstein made a prediction and the study of the binary pulsar by Hulls and Taylor verified that prediction to remarkable accuracy. This took a long time, of course. <clears throat> they started making measurements in 1975, and they're going on for about 30 years after that. The <clears throat> and then this discovery got a Nobel Prize in 1974, uh, 19, uh, a few years after the discovery. So you see, but does it mean that gravitational waves have been detected? No. This is not a direct detection of gravitational waves. It only says that if the gravitational waves are being emitted, then the behavior of this pulsar can be predicted using general relativity. And it is that behavior uh, which has been observed now. But it is gravitational waves have not yet been detected. So for example, if I could have, I could have done some beautiful experiment to show you that uh, gravitational waves, uh, that electromagnetic waves exist. But let us say that we are not able to detect them. Then their existence would not be very useful to you. It may be aesthetically satisfying that they prove the correctness of Maxwell's prediction. But you would not have cell phones, you remember, because you could not detect electromagnetic waves. So how do you detect gravitational waves? Now, <clears throat> before I go to that, just, this is a simulation. So I told you that there's a pulsar here, which is going around another neutron star. And let us see what happens to it. Uh, so you see that as it is going around, it is emitting gravitational waves, which you see from the green surface, which is changing shape. It is a depiction of the space-time structure. The two neutron stars, because the pulsar is also a neutron star, they are moved close to each other. And then they tear each other apart. And then there's a very giant explosion, which is known as the gamma ray burst. And the two together disappear into what is known uh, as a black hole. Right, so, so this is a very beautiful simulation. The point is that the Hulls Taylor pulsar is going to behave like this. It is going to, the two are going to move towards each other and then they will eventually merge and produce a kind of explosion and a black hole. The problem is that it is going to take tens of millions, I mean, hundreds of millions of years to do that, right? So if you want to detect gravitational waves, uh, we cannot wait for a burst of gravitational waves from the Hulls Taylor pulsar because it will be so much into the future. But the question is, are there other such systems emitting gravitational waves and could we find them, could we detect them? So that is the point. So, um, so you see that um, uh, now, Gravitational, I'll, I'll skip these slides here. So I want an instrument for detecting gravitational waves. And how do I do that? I use a very basic property of gravitational waves 
to build the instrument. So you see what is happening here is that you see that it is as if there are all these particles which are spread out here and there's a gravitational wave which is propagating through space. And you, so you see that all the particles are jumping up and down. But what happens to this circle? Right? So there's a circle of particles here. So you see that as the gravitational wave passes by, you will see that first the circle gets stretched as an ellipse in the up-down direction. Then it is stretched as an ellipse in the left-right direction. So that is the property of the gravitational waves. They are going through. And why is the circle behaving like, circle of particles behaving madly like this? That is because, according to general theory of relativity, gravitational waves determines the properties of space-time. So as the gravitational wave is passing through, the structure of the space-time is changing. And um, that is causing the circle to get bigger and smaller, bigger and smaller. Now, how do I use that effect? Yeah, so you see here, there's a very simple way of doing it. I got here a circle. As the gravitational waves passing through, it brings first an ellipse, then an ellipse in the other direction. Now imagine that I got two mirrors here, which are placed along a circle. And this mirror here in the middle is known as a beam splitter. So as the waves, I, um, so here is a beam of laser light, which is going through. And it gets split into two parts because this beam splitter is semi-transparent. One goes to this mirror, one part, and comes here. The other goes to this mirror and then comes back and comes here. When these two mirrors are on a circle, then you see that the length here is the same as the length here. That's equal to just the radius of the circle. The path traveled by the light beam there, there, and here is exactly the same. And so... I don't know whether you have heard of the interference of light, but if you split up light in phase and bring it together, then you get what is known as interference. You get a pattern of waves here. So now you see, now imagine that a gravitational wave passes through, then you get, then it becomes an ellipse mass. It becomes an ellipse. This path is shorter than this path. So a light ray which goes like this will take less time than a light ray which goes like that. And because of that, the pattern of interference here changes. So you see that um, as the wave passes through, then you get an ellipse, and then it again goes to circle, then it again becomes an ellipse, and uh, so on and so forth. So the interference pattern will keep changing, and that can be detected. Right. So that is it is. This is known as the Michelson interferometer. Right. Um, and then you use this concept of a Michael, Michelson interferometer to build a LIGO detector. So what do you have here? So you see that you've got mirrors. There's, there's a, this is the structure is extremely complex. It's very, very large. The laser is very powerful. Why do you need a laser? Because the light should not, it should travel in a straight line. It should not be spread too much. And then it should be very, very intense. And so uh, all that is taken into account in building this kind of an instrument. And it can become a gravitational wave detector. Now, the point is that you need a very large detector. So what has been done is uh, to build a detector like this. Now, this LIGO detector, there are two LIGO detectors in the US. And one is in Hanford, which is in the state of Washington, to the, in the north uh, west of the US. And the other uh, is in Louisiana, which is in the south of the US. And you see that this detector, uh, is very mammoth. So because this is four kilometers and there's a pipe here, one meter diameter pipe, four kilometers long. You've got ultra high vacuum inside it, another pipe like this. So here is a mirror, there is a mirror, and then the, there's a central mirror here, and there's a laser sitting here. So as the gravitational wave passes through, these two lengths will change, and therefore the gravitational wave can be detected. Now you can ask me, how is the length changing? And why don't the lengths that you see change? Meaning that if I keep a meter rod uh, in front of me and keep watching it, then as a gravitational wave passes through, will I see the rod shrinking and expanding? No. Why is that? Does it mean that the rod is not shrinking and expanding? 
it is shrinking and expanding indeed. The problem is that that expansion and shrinking is extremely small. So the change in length which has to be detected um, is far smaller than the radius of a proton. So if I take a length delta L and divide it by L, then because of the passage of a gravitational wave, the change delta L by L is approximately 10 to the minus 18. Right, so therefore you'll see, uh, <clears throat> so you see that's an extremely small change which has to be detected. And so this is a, this experiment requires fantastic precision. So you see that uh, <clears throat> they, it took 20 years to build the LIGO detector and to build it to a precision with which gravitational waves could actually be detected. And the first gravitational wave source is known as 1509 14. So why is it given these digits? Because you know the Americans write uh, dates backwards. So this is the 14th of September 2015. That was the day that the, that the thing was detected. But it took several months to confirm that it was a gravitational wave because the detectors could change their length because of a large number of noisy uh, noises coming in from all kinds of external sources. And what you see here is a gravitational wave detection. So you see, um, now this is the this is in Hanford. They detected a signal which looked like this, and this is in Livingston, uh, which is signal. And then you see that the signal in Hanford and Livingston are both quite identical to each other, which is very important because then you know that it is a real signal and not noise. And here you are you are looking at the detected signal compared with a theoretical signal. So you see what happens here is that there are there are two, actually it turns out that these are not neutron stars, but these are two black holes going around each other. They go around each other and then they, uh, they you see that as they move closer and closer, they are uh, moving faster and faster. And then the rate of gravitational wave emission increases, the amount of energy which is Emitters increases. So, so you see that the wavelength is changing because the, the thing from one maximum to another maximum is reducing. The wavelength is decreasing. The frequency is increasing. And then you see here that there's more and more energy and then suddenly the it sort of comes to a stop. And what you see this part here is known as a ring down. To form a single black hole. And then how much time does it all take? It just takes about 0.7 of a second for this particular source. So now you can imagine. Now what is the, what is the measurements here? So you see that what you can prove from the detected signal, you can make measurements, that one black hole had 36 times the mass of the sun. The other black hole had 29 times the mass of the sun. And when they merged together to form a single black hole, but what is the what is the mass of that black hole? It is 62 solar masses. But 36 plus 29 is 65. So why is this 62? That is because a copious amount of gravitational waves have been detected. And you can show that the total energy which has been, uh, which is emitted as gravitational waves, is equal to exactly uh, three solar masses, which is the difference between one, one black hole mass to another black hole mass minus the resultant mass. So this was a very great event because it was finally proved that black holes exist. It was proved that black hole binaries exist. And then the astonishing thing was that one never expected to find black hole binaries with such large mass. That came as a total surprise. So after that, of course, this is just a depiction of if, if you represent, this is a Schwarzschild radius of the two black holes, and this is the Schwarzschild radius of the merged black hole. So after that, about 40 have been detected now, or the time since 2016 in this four year period. And what has also been detected is the merger of two neutron stars, exactly the kind of object which Hulls and Taylor uh, uh, Hulls and Taylor detected. I told you that it will take hundreds of millions of years for that binary to merge together. 
But here was a binary which was on the point of merging, and we are lucky enough for LIGO to detect it. And <clears throat> you see that when two black holes merge together, you get absolutely nothing from them except a gravitational wave because these are two black holes. And only gravitational wave detectors can detect it. If we have no gravitational wave detectors, such mergers will go completely unnoticed. But when two neutron stars merge together, I showed you in the simulation that they must detect, uh, uh, they must detect gamma ray bursts. They must emit gamma ray bursts. So uh, uh, a short duration, just two second gamma ray burst was indeed found within 1.7 seconds of the detection of the gravitational waves. So that's a really, truly marvelous detection. And you can see here, uh, now this is a picture of this particular galaxy taken in 2017. Uh, sorry, 2017, uh, 2017, uh, April 28, 2017, and this is August 17, the day that soon after the detection was made, and you see this particular new source here. And that is the gamma ray burst, which is being detected at optical wavelengths. So this is a marvelous uh, discovery, right? So LIGO India, in just a couple of minutes, what is LIGO India? So you've got the two LIGO detectors, uh, which are there in, uh, uh, in the US. And the idea is that we build a third LIGO detector in India. And why do you want to do that? Uh, you see, the point is this. Here, here are here's the one detector in, Har in Hanford. Here's the detector <coughs> in, uh, in Livingston. And then if you have a third detector in India, then you see that this is very far from there. The only other point which could be further from the United States would be Australia, but the Australians could not get the money to build a detector, whereas we in India got the money to build the detector, and so we want to put a detector here. And what is the advantage of putting the detector there? You can see this from here. The point is that I told you that gravitational waves travel at the speed of light. So uh, if, a, if a gravitational wave comes obliquely, let us say that it first hits uh, Hanford, then it is the, the travel time from Hanford to Livingston will be 10 milliseconds. Uh, but if the gravitational wave propagates in this direction towards India, then the then you see that the time taken is 36 milliseconds. And the greater is the time taken, the, the longer is the baseline, and the greater is the accuracy with which you can pinpoint the direction from which the gravitational wave has come. And once you know that accurately, then you can then you can actually identify the source of gravitational waves with some cosmic object. So that is the most important part. And therefore, there's a, there's a partnership between different institutes in the country. One is the Inter-University Center for Astronomy and Astrophysics here in Pune. The other is the Institute for Plasma Research in Gandhinagar. And the third is uh, the Raja Ramana Center uh, for Advanced Technology which is in Indore. And so they are all together working to build the gravitational wave detector. But people from all other institutes, the ICERs, IITs, ISCs, universities, institutes, they're all coming together under what is known as the Indigo Consortium to build this sun. So now I come to the end of my talk. Uh, but let me say the following to you. Why did I call it a mega project? Well, I said the LIGO India, a, me a mega project, for the young. So it's called a mega project because it is a very, very large project as I already explained to you. It takes um, more than 10 years to get such a thing through. It requires, um, it requ it requires the efforts of hundreds and hundreds of people and it costs a great deal of money. It costs a few thousand crores to build such a thing. So that is why it is known as a mega project. And what are the other mega projects? Is that the 30 meter telescope, for example, uh, or uh, or AstroSat in some way is a mega project, and then the GMRT uh, is a large project. So there are several of these mega projects around. And why do I say that it's not for the young? That is for the simple reason that uh, it's going to take a long time to build it. And once it is built, then it will be around for 25 or 30 years doing its job.
So those of you who are now in your 11th and 12th standard, who are, let us say, 15 or 16 years old, uh, so 16, 17, 18 years old, uh, then uh, in another 20 years, you will be in the prime of your research career if you become a scientist. And that is the time when LIGO detector will be uh, <coughs> will be operating at its greatest efficiency. So it is young people like you who are going to benefit to this pro from this project and also to contribute to it. So it's a project for the young. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, sir, uh, for the uh, talk. Uh, so we have some questions from the attendees. Uh, so I'll um, start asking the questions, right? So, uh, sir, you uh, talked about gravitational waves and the whole LIGO uh, observatory and the upcoming project in India. And that sounds uh, very exciting. So what all opportunities do Indian students have to work on the LIGO observatory as interns or trainees? So uh, you see that uh, this is true with all the mega projects uh, or all projects in astronomy. I mean, in my institute, for example, Ayuka, we have uh, we have a summer schools for students, uh, and then people come and work as interns. Like, like you say, so there would be some of them would be working on LIGO, some of them would be working on TMT. So there are many many opportunities. And then either an institute like Ayuka or Indian Institute of Astrophysics. So they will advertise for and have the summer schools and internship programs. But you should also be aware, if uh, I'm sure you already are aware, that the Indian academies, for example, there are three science academies in India, INSA and Indian Academy of Sciences, and then there's the <coughs> Allahabad Academy. And then they, uh, they do have these, uh, uh, they also have programs for the internship programs. So there are many opportunities. Yeah, uh, thank you, sir. Uh, so the next question is, uh, where exactly is the location of the LIGO Observatory in India? And is there any specific reason uh, for choosing the location? Yeah, so I, I'm really sorry. I forgot to show a slide on that. Now, so this is near Nanded, and some, uh, some distance away from Nanded, a place called Hingoli, where you have this one. I think, you know, I've forgotten the name uh, momentarily. Um, and then um, uh, what uh, What you actually, uh, why did we go there? Why not some other site? Ours is a very large country. You see that the size of the interferometer is four kilometers by four kilometers. And um, so you require, now the point is that because the detectors are very, very sensitive. So you, you really need a quiet, seismically quiet place. So such meaning what they should not be, you know, that there's micro earthquakes all the time. Some of it are because of natural effects, the shaking of the ground. Some of them are, for example, it, as the waves beat on a beach, you send these seismic waves through the ground. So you can't have, you can't be within closer to more than 150 kilometers of the sea. Then you can't be within 50 kilometers or so from an airport. You can't be within 10 kilometers of a railway line. So when you, when you apply all these things, and then the land should be relatively flat. If it's on a mountain, you can't put a LIGO detector on a mountain. Then you'll have to burrow into the mountain like the Japanese have done. Uh, so when you apply all these things, you get relatively uh, few locations in the country. Okay, so when the survey for the LIGO India site was done, uh, there were four or five sites which are located. And then finally, uh, this was chosen because it was the ideal site. Um, so the next question is, what will be the impact of the LIGO India project uh, on the other disciplines of science and technology in India? Uh, yeah, one moment. Let me let me just go back to my presentation. Yeah, so you can learn lots of, can you see my slide now? Yes, sir. Yeah, you can see, you can learn lots of uh, fundamental uh, physics from this, this thing is interfering with me, yeah. Uh, what are the properties of gravitational waves? Is general relativity the correct theory of gravity? Does it apply 
uh, when gravitational fields are very strong, do real black holes obey the laws of general relativity? How does matter behave when density and pressure are extremely large? Now, these are just example questions, but there are hundreds of questions like which can be answered. So uh, you can talk about neutron stars, stellar mass black holes, massive black holes, gamma ray bursts, and so on and so forth. So you see that gravitational waves are emitted, for example, from rotating uh, binary black holes, binary neutron stars, gamma ray bursts, collapsing stars. And then they are also emitted by the phase transition which take place in the very early life of the universe. So if you can detect gravitational waves, then you can study all these phenomena. And these phenomena are extreme phenomena, meaning that it will be very difficult for you to study them by um, any other means. So it is going to make a, a lot of a contribution to furthering our phenomenal science. Then, as I told you, this huge detector, which you build at such great cost, has to detect a change in wavelength, fractional change in wavelength, which is 10 to the minus 18. So which means that for the LIGO detector, the change in the length is much less than the radius of a proton, right? So therefore, you see that uh, you require extremely precise engineering. And uh, I had no time to go into all those aspects. But, but you see, the point is that the laser, which is there in the LIGO detectors, they are the most powerful lasers on Earth, right? So the vacuum, which is there, is the, the best vacuum possible. So you're working in extreme engineering conditions. So therefore, it requires you to develop very large, very great skills in precision engineering, and which is going to be very useful for you in various other things. Uh, so the next question, uh, which I also had in my mind, uh, you mentioned about uh, other mega projects, uh, like, uh, so I know about a mega project, uh, which is CERN and the Large Hadron Collider, which is located in Europe. So how is LIGO interlinked with CERN? Uh, and the, is there any interlinking uh, between these two mega projects? Yeah, you see, uh, when I talk to mega projects, I only mentioned the astronomical mega projects. And so like that, now CERN is a mega project in that sense. But you see that what you're doing with the, with the instruments in CERN, for example, um, is you're trying to study fundamental physics. Okay, in the sense that how do particles interact with each other at very high energy? And the greater the energy that you have at your disposal, the closer the particles can approach each other. And therefore, the greater the richness of the phenomena which can be studied. So the LIGO detector is not looking directly at uh, these kind of interactions, but it is looking at the gravitational wave interaction. But as I told you, uh, there is a very subtle relationship between them in the sense that uh, you know, you could uh, you could get gravitational waves from the early phases of the universe, and the early phases of the universe are very, very, very energetic. There are far more energies that you can get from CERN, so you can study phenomena which CERN cannot study. So the, uh, all of us are trying to do fundamental physics, and all these instruments, therefore, further uh, further our knowledge of fundamental physics in different ways. Um, so, uh, sir, right now in the uh, world in which we live, artificial intelligence and machine learning is a very upcoming thing and uh, it is going to be the future uh, uh, of the world. So uh, how is artificial intelligence and machine learning going to help in LIGO and uh, also in the astronomy and astrophysics field in general? Yeah, let me, I'll just concentrate on LIGO. So you see that... Uh, I told you that these signals are very weak because gravitation is a very weak interaction. Even though uh, gravitation governs the universe, uh, it is a very weak interaction fundamentally. So when you, when you see the signal, uh, you are not seeing, I showed you that wavy signal. The signal is not very nicely visible when you look at it like that, when you look at the interferometer pattern. What happens is that the ground shakes because of many, many different things. And those... Uh, the signal because of that is far greater than the signal because of gravitational waves. So, so the gravitational wave is riding on all that and you have to learn to extract it from the noise. So now there are many different ways in which you can do it. But as the experience builds up and as you will detect more and more sources and also you can create sources through simulations, uh, then uh, 
then you can have a large training set and then you could apply artificial intelligence to try to detect the real signal riding the the, the weak real signal riding on all kinds of noise which is present there Uh, so uh, the next question is uh, can you please tell us about the nature of your work at, at the uh, isro space commission and uh, the other uh, space bodies you see the uh, what happens is that when you uh, i i i do like everybody else i i have been doing certain kinds of space astronomy now and then like x ray astronomy but uh, my work in isro is mainly to do with different projects and how they are <coughs> uh, i need to calling for projects uh, what are the new projects going to be there to approve the projects study them and so forth now when you got uh, when you got these uh, large enterprises like space or atomic energy now they have to be these are very complex enterprises they also involve national security and then they uh, They are, they are extremely technical in nature, and they cannot be run bureaucratically. And therefore, the government of India has created these commissions. So, there is, for example, an atomic energy commission and a space commission. And the job of these commissions uh, is to ensure the smooth functioning of these organizations, and to provide approvals, to provide guidance, and then to keep the whole thing going. So, the space commission has got uh, very senior people on it. and uh, that is the job which is done to the space commission <clears throat> so so the next question is a bit off topic but i saw mention of pune knowledge cluster in our introductory slide so yes. can you elaborate on that project and can you uh, describe the opportunities for young students uh, in that project too the pune knowledge cluster is a very uh, young organization it started functioning only in august last year and <clears throat> the aim of the pune knowledge cluster is to bring together uh, is, is to bring together all the academic institutes in pune and all the research and development organizations and uh, also the industry to work for projects related to the city so what are the kind of projects that we work on is that uh, to see how many trees there are in pune and you know trees are very important for removing carbon uh, from the atmosphere Carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, and uh, to take up projects like that, and the or the environment-related projects, or there could be electrical vehicles-related projects, and the idea is to, and then we are working on a very important project to do with epidemiology. You know that we are all living in a pandemic now, which is the main reason why we are having this lecture remotely, and there's a lot of data available on the pandemic, but that data has to be properly curated. it has to be corrected it has to be analyzed and uh, then you have to see how the disease spread what was the origin uh, now the, uh, the covid is just, just covid 19 is just one of these diseases but there could be other things like sars or there could be uh, <clears throat> you know you know bird flu is going on now there can be tb uh, there can be flu so the study of all this the spread of these diseases their origin and their prognosis is known as epidemiology so the pkc is helping to create an epidemiological database now other activity which could uh, uh, which could interest you greatly is our we have a capacity building program so we have we arrange lectures and these are not normal lectures that you hear uh, but these will be something which is they are interdisciplinary and then they go beyond what you learn in your college and university for example right now the serum institute of india which as you know is located in pune uh, the experts of that are giving 10 lectures on uh, 10 lectures on vaccines okay so and then you know that there was a fire there two days ago and there was a lecture going on when the fire started okay so then uh, <clears throat> then we are we are going to have lectures on biofuels for example then we'll have a lot of lectures on artificial intelligence and uh, other it related topics but these are all lectures which are Uh, i am mentioning now uh, these are the lectures by uh, by experts these are advanced lectures for phd and above but we'll soon have a lot of programs going on even for young people like yourselves uh, so that you can learn things which you would not normally be able to we'll also be conducting certain webinars so on january the 30th 
there's going to be a very interesting lecture by a lady who's called Lieutenant General Madhuri Kanitkar. She's a doctor. She's from Pune. She used to be an AFMC, but now she's posted in Delhi. And she's going to be uh, talking about <clears throat> her journey and uh, in search of research. Okay, so, so I would invite all of you to attend that lecture. And uh, the thing is, uh, uh, I, will, I will send out the poster both to uh, Professor Dixit and also to the JVP, and then you'll be able to access it from there. Uh, sure, sir. Uh, so, uh, as we all know, you uh, have been a founder member of Ayuka. Uh, and uh, so, can you describe your past and current research activities which are going on at Ayuka? So, you see that um, Ayuka has got, like all other astronomy, good astronomy institutes, it has got three, four different kinds of researches. One would be theoretical thing where you do, for example, work on black holes or cosmology or matters like that. Then there's a lot of observational work goes on on all aspects of the universe. And then instrument building is another very important activity. So, <clears throat> but then to do all this, you require a great deal of data analysis. So I work on, uh, I've started working on quasars. I used to work on general relativity for my PhD. Then I worked on quasars and then I worked on galaxies. And I, I worked on binary systems. I worked on neutron stars and pulsars. But uh, or I'm talking about a very long span of time. But right at the moment, my main interest is in applying artificial intelligence to the study of astronomy. Right. So, I mean, I, I don't have the time now to describe to you what is done. Maybe that will be a topic for the future. So we would love to have you uh, for that topic. Uh, but due to time constraints now, we'll be taking the last two questions. So... Uh, uh, the la uh, one of the last question is, uh, what advice uh, will you give to people of our age uh, to pursue careers uh, for in science and particularly in astronomy and astrophysics for the next de coming decades? Yeah, see, uh, I mean, the, the, the thing is very simple. You have to work hard because a life of research is a hard life. It takes very long because you'll first do your BSc, then your MSc, then you'll do your PhD. Then you do a couple of postdocs, by which time you'll be about 30 to 33 years old, and then you could get a job as a researcher. Of course, from the moment that you start your PhD, you'll be doing research. So it's a long and arduous life. You can do your PhD in any of the institutes in India. You can do it in the universities. You can go abroad and do it. Um, and then um, you'll have to first choose a topic. So right at the moment, if you want to go into research, the question is, what do you do after your 12th standard? So there I would say that there are, two there are two paths which appear to be divergent, but which converge again, is that you could, uh, you could do an MSc in physics. You can do it in the universities. You can do it in the ISERs and IITs and all sorts of other places. Um, there are some places have integrated MSc. And then uh, other path is that you could do your engineering because now you really are too young to decide uh, that you want to do science, you don't want to do science. So you do engineering. And so if you get a good engineering degree, which could be a BE or BTEC or whatever, the branch really does not matter. Then at the end of it, you could continue in your engineering and go into a career as a top engineer and technologist. Or at that point, you could say that, yes, I'm firmly convinced that I'm fond of science. And then you can appear at an interview. And then you, if you do that, if you pass the interview, then you get admission. So about... I would think that 30-40% of the people in Ayuka come from the engineering background. Some of the best, some of the best astronomers they have in India now, astrophysicists, come from the engineering background. So these are the two paths by which you could go into a life of research. Uh, so, sir, uh, we have a question from the live YouTube chat. Uh, it's a bit technical question, but uh, the question is. What is the source of gravitational waves and uh, how can you confirm that it is coming from a black hole? So you see that uh, what is the source of electromagnetic waves? And the ultimate source of electromagnetic waves is an electron which is accelerated because electron has got electric charge and it is accelerated. And if it is moving, it produces an electric current and then you get, because of the acceleration, you get electromagnetic waves. Similarly, 
if you want to have a gravitational wave then you need to accelerate particles very very massive particles when electron has got very low mass uh, in spite of that it emits copiously or when it is accelerated because electromagnetic interactions are very quite strong compared to gravity gravitational interactions are typically 10 to the minus 40 times the electromagnetic interactions so you need very large masses stellar size masses and black hole you must understand that a single black hole cannot emit gravitational waves because it's a it's an object with a lot of symmetry there's two black holes which are going around they emit gravitational waves because each black hole accelerates the other black hole and you can calculate using einstein theory as to what is the rate at which they will emit similarly you could have a neutron star and a black hole binary or you could have black hole and a star binary or whatever but as i already told you black holes are also emitted in the gravitational waves are also emitted in a variety of circumstances uh, wherever there is an explosion wherever there is asymmetry wherever there is acceleration thank you yeah uh, so so the one last question before i ask my teammate to take over uh, is what advice will you give for the tssn team for conducting future activities and helping uh, other young people yeah i i see i don't have very much advice because whatever you are doing is completely right and doing things like this uh, and uh, <clears throat> having lectures by a variety of people because you had one by shashidhara on biology then you had one by anand deshpande on it now i am going to give on astrophysics so that's a very good thing but you must also learn to work with your hands so for example through the pkc we will be starting a citizen science program and we want to do the citizen science program in three different layers one layer would be uh, real citizens who have no particular background in science but who can contribute the other layer Uh, will be for example amateur astronomers amateur scientists and people like yourselves who have real interest in science they can contribute and the third layer will be students who let's say who are finishing their bsc or doing their msc and who want internships so all these three layers will be able to contribute so there you will get some hands on experience so i'll like say keep watching for our notices but that is just one narrow path of doing well there's so many other opportunities available because you can do the same thing in biology you can do in it and you can do in engineering whatever so thank you so much sir um, we we love to have you here and uh, we thank you for, uh, uh, for taking time out of your schedule um, so over to isha thank you jinmay i would like to take a moment to sincerely thank professor kembavi sir for spending his valuable time with us and giving us a very interesting insight into the project of lago india i would also like to thank lago india and jyotir vidya parisastha for their support while organizing this session it was a riveting and fascinating session and i'm sure our audience took home some interesting information about gravitational waves the lago in hanford louisiana as also lago india i believe i speak for everyone when i say that all of us are now intrigued and looking forward to lago india and possibly contributing to this project it was an absolute honor to have you with have you here with us today a gentle reminder to all our attendees we will be sending out feedback forms for today's session please fill them and let us know your feedbacks once again thank you professor kembavi sir thank you all thank you very much it's been a great pleasure Thank you sir